And welcome to Frankly Speaking, where truth is our mission, reality our realm, set as we see it and frankly as well. I'm Joe Spino, along with Paul Crowley and our very special guest, the Honorable Mayor of the City of Lynn, Judith Flanagan Kennedy. Thank welcome, you. Judy. Thank you, Good to Paul. have you. Thank but, you for having me, Joe. Well, it's a pleasure. But before we begin, we've got to put things in context. Uh, and we're going to start with Frankly Joe, and then Frankly Paul, and we'll get on with the show. How's that one? Sounds good. So a little context here, folks, because it's very important. The City on the Brink, that's my title. According to key department officials, the influx of illegal immigrants, children, and families into Lynn is stressing almost every service, from trash collection to health care, and especially the Lynn school system. Early on, the city was able to absorb these children, not anymore. The number one driver of Lynn's budget is education. So when the Obama administration and then Governor Patrick's administration placed hundreds of Guatemalan immigrants into one of the state's most economically depressed cities without providing assistance, that was not good. Compounding these things was a directive from the Department of Justice issued in May of 2000, uh, 2014 that stated that Lynn must enroll all children in its public school system, regardless of their immigration status. Further, the city was prohibited from verifying the ages of the migrants. The net result of federal and state policies is the cost of education spiked by 9.3%. Health care costs also increased, as did the cost of other city services. In the private sector, the cost of rentals rose sharply. Regretfully, all other municipal department budgets, including those of fire and police, were cut. Meanwhile, nothing but silence from the city's elected representatives of both the state and federal levels. I wouldn't say silence. They want more illegal immigration, they want more uh, refugees, they want more and more, more pushed into the system at a time when we're, gonna, what, an $8.6 million deficit you're trying to figure out? Uh, and they want to add start, all these people? When we started the budget process, we had a $9.7 million deficit to it. We're going to get to that, Paul. Why don't you get to your uh, little thing there, and I want to have you, you with the permission from the mayor, do a little exchange that I think the folks will find interesting and then we'll get right into the meat of everything. Okay, okay so I get to do Frankly Paul now? Yeah, putting things in perspective, okay. Mr. Paul. Okay, so in, in order to understand the fiscal plight that the city of Lynn is up against, it is important to understand the context of the economic and regulatory problems of the Obama years. President Barack Obama is the only president in U.S. history to not have a single year where the economy grew at by at least 3%. The hard fact is that despite 10 trillion, that's with a TR trillion dollars in deficit spending, I, I want you all at home to try to write 10 trillion with the zeros on a piece of paper. See if you can do it without finding yourself running out of paper because there are so many zeros you won't even believe it. Anyway, so 10 trillion dollars in deficit spending as a measure of gross domestic product. The past eight years produced the worst economic growth in our nation's history. Effectively, the nation's economy grew slower than even during the Great Depression. Nevertheless, Barack Obama and, its, and his supporters pursued policies and regulations that effectively strangled the already struggling municipalities across America. As a lot of you know, Detroit went bankrupt and so did Stockton, California. That Lynn survived is a minor miracle. For those who align themselves with the regulatory and economic policies of the Obama years, good riddance. So, Mayor, do you have any comments on uh, our opening statements? Well, um, it is very true that our school budget has been affected substantially by the number of newcoming students that we have. I looked uh, back at fiscal year 210, which was mm -hmm. the year in which I took office. The school budget was about $107 million of direct cash from the city's mm -hmm. budget. For FY18, that number is going to be around $141 million. So that's, that's four, roughly... $41 million dollar increase? Well, uh, $35 million, Anyways, but right, yeah. approaching 40% increase over the last eight years. 
And that really is directly attributable to the increase in the school population that we've had. Back again in 2010, we had about 13,750 students. We are now over 16,000 students, making us the fifth largest school district in Massachusetts. And only the eighth largest city, or ninth. Ninth, ninth, ninth right. largest. Pedro, I don't know, uh, our, our producer back, I can't see him anymore, so it drives me crazy. We have some stats to that effect about the school population uh, currently, I think mm -hmm. it's 16.5, and we try to compare it with Quincy, which is about the same population, about. slightly larger than Lynn, who have 9,000. Right? Is that right? There's only 9,000 students in Quincy, yet they're about the same size as us? Yes. Are you kidding me? So that means no. that we have 7,000 plus more students in the city of Lynn than in uh, an equivalent city. That's crazy. Yeah. Think about that. Now, and that is a direct result of, because our ratio, this is the interesting point. May I see if I'm correct on this? The surrounding communities, roughly 10% of their population are in the school system. So if you have, like Salem has uh, 37,000, now they have 3,700 students, roughly, okay? That's, that's Same good, thing in Saugus, good. you know, they have 26,000, they have 20, 2,600 kids. Mm -hmm. Quincy has 93,000, they have, as you pointed out, about 10%. Lynn is approaching 20% yes. of our population. Now. What's fascinating, if you look behind the numbers, here is what, why I want to put things in context. You were up against this, and in 2014, three years ago to this date almost, you went all over the place seeking assistance. You recognized the problem. You didn't sit there and say, oh, let it be. You said, no, no, I'm going to get proactive. You went to Washington, D.C., you were on national television, and Paul, could you do me, Mayor, would you entertain me? Stuart Viney, Paul, you're going to have your British accent. <laughs> this I'm happened. Use my, my, my Lynn accent. Yeah. If you don't mind. And our world in 2014, national television, you were interviewed by Stuart Viney. Yes. You're going to be Mr. Viney, and may I guess what? You're going to be Judith Flanagan Kennedy, if you could. I'm not sure if I can imitate can you play that her, part? but I'll try. All right, so, what, so effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to replay for the audience. You're going to read that transcript what as happened it three was. years ago. It right. happened three years ago, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, Mr. Varney. And, and I'm Stuart Varney. Yeah. You don't look so, like So, him. Your Honor, I understand that you have got, what is it, 248 children from Guatemala alone in your school system on a very short notice. Is that accurate? Yes, that's the number between the ages of 14 to 17 in the last two years, school years. How? Who's paying for them? We are. What special services do you have to provide for nearly 250 teenagers? I mean, do they speak English? Often they come in not speaking English and not even speaking Spanish, but speaking a dialect, a village dialect from their home province. So, and in that case, many of them are also illiterate in both languages. We're really starting with the older children, if you want to call them that, who have had little or no formal schooling. Did you know they were coming? No, we have gotten no notice until they arrived. I mean, they literally arrived on buses or planes and were shuttled to Lynn, Massachusetts to put straight into your school system. I don't think they came all at once. We started noticing in the fall of 2012 that we had about 60 new registrations in the city schools that were all coming, I think it's called San Marcos in Guatemala, and we started questioning why this was happening. And as it turns out, it was the first wave of these unaccompanied minors. Now, can you cope? I, I'm talking financially. Can you cope financially? This year, and I was talking about FY 2015, I had to increase my school department budget by 9.3% and have had to cut all of my city budgets between 2% and 5% to make up for the influx of unaccompanied children and the surge. We have had over 1,000 not native-born children enter our school system in the last four years. Have you applied for federal assistance? We have reached out to members of the federal delegation here and have not gotten any response, have not gotten any fi financial assistance, so I plan to go to Washington, D.C. next month and meet with members of the Judiciary Committee to see if I might be able to obtain some kind of assistance to help my city. One last point. We said 248 youngsters from Guatemala. 
Are there other youngsters, illegal immigrants in your school system, and how many? Yes, there are, but it's a handful compared to the number coming from this particular province in Guatemala. Mayor Kennedy, thank you very much for taking time with us today. I know that you're very busy with flooding in your area. Thanks for taking time. We do appreciate it, ma'am. Thank you. And I thank you. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank you, too, for ignoring all of these typos that were in there and uh, that you read wonderfully. Flooding was taking place at that point in time, so you were hit with a double whammy yes. with this major flood problem plus a flooding of migrants into the city. And, and we're first of all stretched for building capacity, so that's problem number one. In the schools. Um, in the schools. Mm -hmm. And the money that we put toward many of the um, capital building projects that we undertake cannot be counted toward our net school spending number that the state requires that we meet. So for example, when we did the Thurgood Marshall Middle School, we could not count the money, uh, there was about $3.1 million, $3 million spent on eminent domain takings to build the Marshall Middle School. That was money that had to come out of the city side of the budget. It would not count toward net school spending. When we did the plan designs, that money could not be counted toward net school spending. Uh, last year, I had to add two portable classrooms at the Tracy Elementary School due to the overcrowding there that $250,000 could not count toward net school spending. So we have primarily a mm -hmm. space problem and secondarily a financial problem because that surge in the required school budget spending has necessarily had an effect on the amount of money we have left to provide all of the other services in the community. Paul, you brought up this point the last time we was discussing this one was you know, happening, uh, Thurgood Marshall Middle School, mm -hmm. where we were sold a bill of goods that it was going to be 20% uh, of 90 million, otherwise translate to 18. Right. Mayor, you were not in on this, so I mean, it was others who gave us a false uh, impression. Well, and you know, I, 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 and and I'm, I'm not saying that they lied, I just, uh, but I will say that there was, um, you know, wasn't complete understanding of the implications. You know, the 20% rule, mm -hmm. it, it is in fact true that we get 80% money but there's only certain money that's eligible for that 80%. But the and mayor, a lot of it is 100% on us. The net effect being that we end up being more like 40, 45, well, maybe even 50%. That was my point. So the mayor just explained how many costs came to building the Thurgood Marshall Middle School and also to look at other possibilities with the two right. school situations. And, and, yes. But the biggest part of that problem, and this is it, it, it's, it's a voodoo economics in my view, because the mayor is forced to say that it either it does or does not uh, uh, fit into the net school spending calculation, That's which right. is an operational question. You know, how much does it cost us to, to um, support the, the needs of the children in the school system? If you have X amount of dollars that you have to spend in the school system, and all that gets to be counted towards net school spending, and you still don't have enough, they expect you to spend more even if you don't have it. So the, the, you know, they, they have these, and to me this is a crazy rule. They, they should be looking at this, especially for a city like Lynn, where we have almost 20% of, of our population are students. Mm -hmm. They should be looking at us very differently than anybody else. A you know, waiver, um, uh, just um, a one-off kind Who of Who should be looking at the taxpayers the, the and the voters of the city of Lynn? It, May I, he said voodoo economics, interesting term. It is voodoo economics, isn't it? It's a state formula that was created uh, let's see, in the 1990s, so we're talking well over 20 years ago, this formula was created and the state legislature to this point has not seen fit to modify it. And I think it acts very disproportionately unfairly to gateway cities and urban centers. For example, we have five schools that we're operating right now that uh -huh. are over 100 years old. So you could argue, and I think you could make a good argument, that a city such as Lynn needs to be spending some of its education dollars on capital improvements, Absolutely. on building expansion. And yet, if I want to add more classrooms, if I build a building, it doesn't count toward net school spending. If I um, were to add portable classrooms, such as I did at Tracy, that doesn't count toward net school spending. If I lease someplace, I can count that toward net school spending, but only if that leased premises is intended to be used for three years or fewer. 
and we are showing no sign of the school population diminishing. So therefore, even that lease wouldn't be able to count toward net even school spending. Even with the new administration and the ebbing of the flow of unaccompanied minors into the United States, you have, that has not kicked in yet? It has not. And, and I'll give you another example of why it affects urban areas disproportionately. It does. If you were to look at a town such as Wellesley, uh, um, um, just pick any town. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, um, they generally have very stable populations. There are so many homes in the area. They have 2.1 children per household or whatnot. So it's pretty easy for a smaller, stable, population-wise community to be able to make a good determination of what their net school spending figure is going to be from year to year. It might increase or decrease by 30 students or so per year. Yes. Our school system is fluctuating, always in the positive direction. Over the past several years, we've gone, as I said, from 13,700 to over 16,000. And yet, we don't have a net increase in the number of classrooms, and yet if we want to have a net increase in the number of classrooms, we have to take that money away from police, fire, DPW, and what's the net result? I want to correct you. You use <coughs> the word positive. The positive actually is negative. Well, right. when we're talking Become, the net result growth, is growth, negative. They, they, are, the they have positive growth right. as opposed to positive negative growth. Positive growth is negative when you can't control it. You know, when it, see, this is the problem. You're right. If you take a community like Swampscott and Marblehead, which is fairly stable, mm -hmm. okay, as far as population is concerned, and the ratio of children per household is fairly stable, that's not the case in Lynn. No, absolutely not. And that, it, I, I, look, I have nothing against people who are newcomers coming into the city. I'm simply staying to the state and to the federal government, mm -hmm. be fair about it. It, it is beyond question that the city of Lynn gets more than its fair share, <clears throat> excuse me, of newcomers. Um, it is also beyond question that w when you're calculating net school spending, I, I should add this as well, if they are children who, for whom English is a second language, not their native language, right. that adds a premium onto the expected per student spending for that child. And if you have a student uh, who needs uh, special attention, special needs, an IEP, there's another premium required under the net school spending formula. And many, many of the children who are coming into our system qualify for both of those. But they also, on the flip side of that, is as mentioned in our introduction, there are many who are coming who do not speak either Spanish or English, have no education, and consequently they're driving our performance scores down, which discounts some of the monies that we're getting. Is that true or false? Yes, and, and one of the things that the city tried to do, because we recognize that, and we also recognize that some of the older um, students who have been coming in over the past few years wanted to work during the day. And because of that want or need to work during the day, our dropout rates continue to Skyrocket. increase because they'll go to school for a while and then realize that they need to make a living, so they'll drop out of school, um, mainly during spring and summer months, and then in the fall they'll re-enroll, in the spring they drop out. Now, if that's the same individual who has done that, that counts as two dropouts for our city. So our dropout rate goes up substantially. And that hurts. It affects the state's And then you also ran across a problem with the ACLU, if I'm not, and maybe not the ACLU, but some similar, yes. in that you try to establish, accommodate that dynamic you talked about, so that the older students who had to work during the day could go to school in the evening. Yes. They said, no, no, no. That's exactly right. We had a night school established. It met for four hours. Four days a week, we provided an evening meal. We concentrated on English language learning as part of the curriculum of that night school. And we were approached by a lawyer from the Children's Law Center who informed us that because we were not providing the same number of hours and the same, uh, you know, so-called no equal education mm -hmm. opportunity mm -hmm. that was available in the day program, that we were required to either expand the night program to the 990 hours right. a, a year or to integrate all of these new students into the daytime program. And I truly do believe that uh, while I'm a lawyer and I understand the rationale behind that, 
it was not a good fit for those students. They I'm were not a actually... lawyer, and I do not understand the rationale behind that. Can I just say yeah, that, that, Go that ahead. this is nuts? Of course, the it, reign it, of insanity. It, it's nuts in so, on so many levels. I mean, you know, here we are, you know, being, and I'm sure the mayor hears this from time to time, that she somehow doesn't care for um, people of color or, because, or, or these kids that are coming here and they have nothing because you're trying to solve a problem. And you got these crazies who say, we need to take them all, we need to take them all, we need to take them all. Don't worry about it, just keep them coming, keep them coming. What do you mean we don't have any money? You gotta go find the money, you know? <laughs> okay, uh, it, it, let me be very clear about this. This is an economic problem Absolutely. for the city of Maine. This has nothing to do with immigration or immigration status. It is about a surge of a population increase that is un manageable with the, the absorption rate cannot keep up with the number of and you're going to get sued by the ACLU in. for not doing it fast enough and I've proposed, <laughs> an, I've proposed a number of solutions why don't we start a regional school where people who need to be caught up on their integration into American culture and have it be paid for by every community in the region regardless of whether they have students that attend it even even if the the relocators are going to send everybody every newcomer to the city of Lynn well, help us to pay in some way, I whether love that it's term. direct assistance from the federal government, whether it's some sort of a waiver or a break from the state, allowing us to build some new schools or allowing us to lease some more space or giving us the assistance to change that night program from what we could handle, right. which was four hours, four days a week, to the 990 hours. The, the there, there are plenty of solutions. I'm not looking for anything other than an economic yeah, of course. equitable was the word you used equitable economics yeah yeah and, and you know I, I would just say that you know to the point that you were making earlier mm -hmm. mayor and that is and, and i'm going to make a comparison the state of massachusetts spends 40 percent of its budget on mass health you know the the medicaid fortune and every time that mass health increases to a point that doesn't that is higher than the rate of increase in the revenues in, in, at the state level, it crowds out other uh, necessary services mm -hmm. and things that the state provides, including education. So, so the same thing that's happening at that level is what's happening with you. The we, we are being overwhelmed by the need to increase our spending in education but, and but the fire the and the police and, and all that suffers. That's descriptive of what's happening. My point is, where are our elected officials? Where are those who we entrusted to solve problems? You couldn't find them. No. She was out there fighting at the national level, at the state level, everywhere. She was screaming and yelling. You know, you want to use a, a word I can't stand from politicians, I'm going to fight for you. Well, she actually was. Right. But the rest of them who claimed they're fighting, you, I'll tell you, you couldn't where find they were. them with a Geiger counter. I'll tell you where they were. They were hiding under the table no because kidding. they didn't want to have to admit that the fact is that they support things that are unsustainable. And then they want and, to get elected to and office. They more, and they want more money. And they want to say, I know how to fix the problems. I want to talk about, I'm going to steal a thing from David Letterman, who I don't really particularly like, by the way, folks, I'm glad he's retired. But we're going to talk about the 10 things that weren't, that now are. You like that one, Paul? Yeah, let's say, the I, 10 I, things curious. that were, weren't, that were not, that now are. And one of them, and you took very good care of your veterans because you're the only or the first city first in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that was certified by the federal government as having ended homelessness among vets. And I applaud you for that. Thank you. That was uh, truly, truly a team effort. Led by Harry McCabe, McCabe over at the Lynn Housing Authority. We had partners from the social worker arena, from uh, the mental health field, from uh, the the advocacy field, really from the VA, it took a consortium of uh, groups and people to get an organized system whereby we could keep track of the veterans that were in here. Of course, Lynn's Mike Sweeney in the Veteran Services Office of the City of Lynn uh, was greatly involved as well. 
But once we got the tracking system in place, and it was all done anonymously so as not to violate anybody's yeah. privacy. The ACLU didn't step in, huh? No, it huh. was done all in accordance with any applicable laws. But, but by creating a way of knowing what one agency was doing vis-a-vis -vis another agency, there was an ability for them to coordinate the efforts. And it took a couple of years to bring everything to fruition. But as of, uh, I think it was two years ago, we were officially certified, designated as the first city in Massachusetts with a functional zero homelessness. Did you veterans. notice? Did you notice that she didn't take credit for that, Paul? Did you know she spread the wealth? It, it's it, unusual, it, isn't it? It's inappropriate. It, 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 it couldn't I like have that. been done no. by one person. No. Well, it, I'm glad it, that you said that. A lot of other people beat their chest. I stand up against Trump. So, That's so, a famous so one. I, I would love to just add to that because now that we've ended functional homelessness for veterans in the city of Lynn. There's now efforts underway, I think they're already underway to end uh, functional homelessness for the youth of our city. And I met with Harry McCabe and Charlie Gator a few weeks back, and we're gonna do the same thing for the elderly population. We're gonna have a, there's gonna be a big event, and I think you'll be there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's towards the end of, um, uh, June, and I hope to be a big part of that, and you know, just trying to work, coordinate, and be part of a consortium. <laughs> all the groups that are necessary to make these things happen. And we're Good do things the same happening thing. in Lynn. Right. Good things happening in Lynn. Huh? And and it has become a model for other communities to Very follow. Good. And I, I think we should follow our own model when it comes to the youth, and and that's particularly important. Lynn has a lot of children who have been in the foster care system, but once they age out of the foster care system. They're deposited into society, and there's no real net that they no. have been used to having. So that one is is very important, and and, in, and of course the elderly, it's important. And and I have to point out, we use the term functional zero because there are some people, whether it's because of a, a diminished mental capacity or some kind of a, a mental illness or a phobia yeah. that for whatever efforts we make, they will not want to be living in right. a permanent home. So there are those people who will just continue to prefer to remain on the streets right. and they're not ill and, and enough for us to take them in involuntarily. So the best we can look for is a functional zero, right. which means that everybody who's seeking shelter right. will we gotta, have that shelter. We gotta move on because we only got one and we got nine more to go. <laughs> and I okay. wanna get these things out of here. Right. Right? Uh, and this is quick because as you took office, and I, I, folks, this goes to show you about a thing called integrity, which is sadly lacking in many elected officials today. Uh, before we went on air, I mentioned about the crackdown of EBT abuse and that took place in the city of Lynn. It was a fraud case, and also it was drug-related, too, and 211, I, and I applauded you for that. And once again, she said, well, that wasn't me. It just happened during my administration. It, so. was, it was the state. I can say that we did have an operation that occurred several years ago to um, wipe some of the gang members out of the city of Lynn. It was called Operation Melting Pot, and it was done in assistance with the federal government, and as a result, Result, many of those drug dealers and gang leaders received federal prison sentences. That's good. It, it's those stick. The, yeah. the state prison sentences do not get them off the streets for very long, if at all, and then they're right back on but the, the feds, street doing that's their a different thing. Issue. And as a result, we went from approximately 1,200 gang members at that time to about 350 now. We also have organizations that I love, such as LISOA, which is run by um, a, 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 a former gang member who Antonio. has the Antonio mm -hmm. Gutierrez, right. who has the credibility to speak to some of the hardest core gang members yeah. in the city and get them to turn things around. We have straight ahead ministries that goes into prisons. Their, one of their many purposes is to go there and educate the inmates before they're released back into society, trying to get them to make better choices when they come back out. So they're not repeating the same mistakes of, of their life pattern as they had been up to that point. And another one is ROCA, which uses data-driven um, evidence-supported um, techniques to keep people out of jail on the straight and narrow. So all of those things combined 
but definitely starting with Operation Melting Pot. So you're not a so you're not a uh, heartless Republican, huh? I mean, you have a moral <laughs> compass. I, I mean, I, shock, I shock, shock. I would consider heartless Republican almost well, you know, an oxymoron in my case. I agree okay? with you. Can I add something to that? Yes. You know, yeah. The Democrats who pound their chest talking about how how much they care mm -hmm. uh, are so busy talking about how much they care they forget to care. How's that? I don't well, know. Ask the people in Detroit how they're doing and in Stockton, California, I and Chicago, and New York. I don't know how York. many mayors have gone into the jails and prisons to talk to the inmates either, but that was one of the most um, unforgettable experiences I've had in, in these eight years was going to Middleton Jail and sitting down with a bunch of inmates who were probably in the pre-release program. They were close to coming back out on the street, and I asked them all, like, what, what do you think? was the factor that, that drove you to this. What, what is it that you have to change? And a lot of them just felt like they didn't belong with their families. I think there was a lot of culture clash because they were growing up in America, adopting American values. Their parents might have been from a different country with a different set of mores and values. And they felt like they, did no, they no longer fit with their family. And they started to consider outside groups, namely gangs, as their new right. family. And it happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and the city of Lynn would have a disproportionate amount of folks that fit that profile as opposed to some of these other communities. Wellesley, as you mentioned, that would be like, uh, you know, a non-existent. But, but you have to deal with that population. Well, it's it, we are the largest urban community on the North Shore, so it, that's it comes true. But that's with true. You the are the mayor being. of a blue collar, collar urban community that's mm -hmm. beset with a whole bunch of social economic problems that other communities don't have. So, in order to be successful at what you do, so that Lynn does not go by way of Detroit or by way of Chicago, where you're dodging bullets every day. I mean, you're safer in Afghanistan than you are in Chicago, and on and on it goes. Now, there's a common denominator, and I love saying it to you folks out there, I want you to think about it. Those cities are run by liberal progressive left, and they're going down the tubes. So if you want to elect liberal leftists, be my guest. And don't say anything when you go by way of Detroit. If you want good management, take care and take a look at people that know how to manage, who have feelings, thoughts, and are inter not in. No, it bothers me, Judy. It really bothers me when people label you Il Palo Italiano. You sono, I'm an immigrant kid. So nobody's going to tell me about the immigrant situation and try to rate, tell me that I'm xenophobic or something to that effect. My grandparents. It's economics. My, it's, my grandparents came from Italy. I so. know that. You have, you have pasta every Sunday with your mother. <laughs> and Paul goes down, you have that Greek, <laughs> what do you have, that uh, stuffed grape leaves or whatever they have? You know? <laughs> Anyways, tell me about this reverse 911. I mean, my daughter told me about it. I have no idea what it is. And yet, it's supposed to be a very good thing. She was uh, very excited about it. Well, it's something that we introduced really um, probably in my first year of, of coming into office. I was a little bit surprised that Lynn had never taken the step. Um, it's a little bit of a, a misnomer. What it is, it's an emergency notification system so that if the city has important messages that need to get out to the community. I think one of the first times we used it was during Hurricane Irene to keep people updated with the weather forecast and whether we were going to have a shelter, an emergency shelter open and how they could get there. Um, if we had blizzards coming in, we would talk about parking vans and um, any, any relevant information that would be pertinent to the um, emergency at hand. So we started that for $16,000 with a company called Rapid Notify, and it has worked out wonderfully. That's a great bang for the buck, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. The problem is we have a lot of people who change phone numbers constantly, yeah. so the new numbers aren't always in the data bank, um, but that can be cured. They can call the mayor's office and ask to be added to the reverse 911 list. Um, they can call the fire department's headquarters, and they will take down the name and add it to the reverse 911 list. Uh, but it works wonderfully, and it's a great system because let's say we had something that was um, particular to just a particular part of the city, like a fire in Lynn Woods. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to need to know about that who lives down on Lynn Shore Drive. But the people whose homes abut the woods would certainly want to know about the progress of containment of a forest fire in Lynn Woods. Mm -hmm. So we can tailor the call that goes out to particular sectors 
of the city. It can be done street by street. It can be done ward by ward. It can be done by trash collection. So if whatever reason a trash collection is going to be de delayed by one day, we can notify just those people in the affected area. And like you said, $16,000, how, how could you That's possibly go bank, wrong? Yeah. But people sometimes forget that we never had that before. You wanna hear a good one? What? He was born where the frozen food section at Stop and Shop <laughs> now exists. That's right, yeah. According to my mother, that's right. I was, I was born, born in Which I was leads in. us to. <laughs> oh, the, the, um, the new market basket, right? Oh, yeah. ho, ho, ho. And by you the like way, that, huh? I love that rotary, but I'm going out of my mind because every time I go in there, you get into the rotary and at least two of the exits are blocked. Let me can tell you. Can you tell them to fix that? Can I yeah. tell you how the rotary came about? Sure. And it's technically not called a rotary. I, <laughs> learned, I learned this during my meetings with the traffic engineers. It's called an egg about. That is a your what? new word for the day, egg about. It's like a roundabout, like a rotary, but it's shaped in an oval shape. And it's designed in such a way that it provides continuous slow of tra flow of traffic, but it has a narrowing, a forced narrowing by right. the design there's only, there's of it. There's only one lane in, yes. the, in the road. So that the, the traffic goes continually because all of us have been on Western Ave at three o'clock in the afternoon when the traffic is backed up down to the right. near the Fox Hill Bridge. This and and when the traffic engineers did the study of that intersection, they they designated it as an E intersection. Now intersections are given letter grades A B C D E. E means it's a mess. That, there's no, that's the, <laughs> the technical term for it. But by providing this egg about shape, they expect the traffic intersection to become a C, which means only moderate delays at peak times of traffic in the city. So, and so, so, so we could say that in, a, in addition to accommodating the additional flow of traffic that will come because of a market basket there, it's actually gonna help even before the market basket yes. is up and running. So yes. What about the other end of Market Street? What's going on down there? Are they going to do anything? Is there going to be traffic lights or any other kind of stuff at that end? Uh, like, like where the Hibernians is? And the oh, you're talking about the other end of Market Basket. Yes. Um, there have been some studies done right now that are looking at potentially making Marion Street, I think it's Marion Street that runs from Boston Street up to the Hibernian Hall, um, making that a one way and putting another smaller rotary in a Gannis Square to provide for the traffic flow because Market Basket studies are showing that a, a very large number of their customers are going to be coming using the Boston Street uh, throughway mm -hmm. because it's gonna be either Saugus or West Lynn that they expect to be patronizing the shop for the most right. part. But the point was, because there was no market basket. No, there, is one. there now is. Right. Well, there was a GE, and that was the first step, was getting GE to the table to sell that property. But when you said, I do, there was no market basket. No. So what was, now is. or what wasn't, now is. Yes. And that's the same, although there was an existence of the Thurgood Marshall Middle School, it was condemned by any reasonable person. Mm -hmm. To which we now have a state of the art that happened, that wasn't, no. But now is during your administration, we correct? We started the statement of interest. Uh, the first hearing on it was in January of 2010. So and it was built? Under budget or on budget and ahead of time, ahead of schedule. Sound like Donald Trump. <laughs> so, so, so Mayor, can I I have, I have uh, legislative constraints and, and government constraints that Apparently I Apparently because you said with. no to that small little increase in the meal tax, and I think you're absolutely right about that, by the way. You know, that it, it is literally a fraction of a penny on the dollar, but we had just come off within two months of that discussion, the, the two to one, um, denial of the building of new schools for two hundred dollars a year in tax, exactly. tax increases. Exactly. I mean, folks. And, the, and I didn't want to appear tone deaf to the citizens of Lynn, who said very clearly, "We don't want to pay any new taxes. Live within your means." And so, it was really a matter of principle. I mean, I'll be the first to tell Princi you another seven hundred thousand dollars in the city coffers will ease the budget crunch and, and help me. But what is but wrong with principle? Maybe that's what's lacking today. Maybe we should have people who think about principle first. You can't, it's too, it's too confusing. And I'm gonna use this opportunity to ask the mayor a question. Okay. So, the day before the last 
day of school f for the kids at the old Marshall Middle School, right? Mm -hmm. There were 900 to 1,000 kids in there, and there were a bunch of teachers and administrators and all that kind of stuff, right? In the, and then they all moved out the next day, right? So, yep. they, so they move into the new school. Immediately, the old school was condemned and no kids should be allowed in the school. That's right. Well, yeah. It how, is, how can you say that that's the case if you were allowing them in the day before? It, it's not suitable for use as a modern middle school. It's I mean, not, it wasn't, I, I it wasn't going to collapse on anybody. There was no environmental hazard that was going to be affecting those children. But the, the environment clearly was not right. conducive. But, the, but this to is the kind of nonsense that you deal with. So the, the, the state says out, out of the one side of their mouth. Um, you know, we're not going to give you money for a new school, 80% or whatever, or they're they, they, they going to really make it very difficult for you to get the school built that takes years to do and all that kind of stuff. And, and then they say, you just keep them where they are, you know, in effect, right? And then as soon as you build the new school, they say, oh, you can't go in there. You know, it, it, to me, it, I, it, I could it, give you some statistics. But that's the kind of stuff that they do all the time. I could give you some anecdotal evidence from my perspective that would say that that building was a health hazard in the 70s serious health hazard i know many teachers have been taught there for many years who unexpectedly came down with the big c disproportionate to the population of the school and i can give you a whole list that's another subject wyoming square that wasn't is right the parking lot behind the... Well, the, the, the Wyoming Square redesign was done in conjunction with the state. The um, redesign of the Wyoming Square parking lot was my idea. I thought it would be a very good idea to expand it because it was crowded. I mean, the, the spaces True. were poorly aligned. Uh, you had people sometimes going up there to watch the Little Leaguers play on the Wyoming field, which created a, a bit of a hazard, having pedestrians in the parking lot. And we weren't making any money from it. So we worked with Charlie Gaeta and the Lynn Housing Authority to acquire an easement down where the um, Meadow Court housing yep, yep. development is, and we took some of that land, and we were able to build up that land using a retaining wall, and we were able to expand that um, parking lot to about 100 spaces now, and it had been about half that prior to that. That's good, We though. put in solar-operated kiosks so people can pay automatically. Um, we put in a little bit of a viewing area for people who want to go and watch their kids play baseball, which is separated from the, the lot itself, and we made it so that it's one way coming in from Wyoma Square, and in order to exit, you have to get down into the That's the um, part I don't like, because I have to come back to Wyoma Square. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well no, then you'll appreciate this, Paul, because originally we were going to say right turn only, so we didn't right. have people right. coming out well, you, across well, the well, I never have any trouble getting out, though. Yeah. But Paul, and, and was, was it a good thing? Yes. The point is, was it a good thing? Absolutely. Was and, it a positive? And, and, what did and it I exist? Would say, and I, I'm joking about the, the negative impact on me because it really wasn't a negative impact. But and I will say that I don't see where anybody lost on this one. No. So that was a good thing. The we got to move on because okay. we don't have that much time Sorry. left on this show. You know? Okay. We have a bunch, and I've noticed this, my son particularly, we have a, a bunch of niche cafes and eateries popping up all over the place. I think that can be attributable to... The auditorium, which mm -hmm. at first attracted um, new restaurants like Rosetti's and R.F. O'Sullivan, they're two, two of the restaurants that specifically cited the auditorium as a reason that they expanded their business into the city of Lynn. Both were existing restaurants. But I noticed there's a lot of more traffic and more activity in the downtown area. You mentioned this a lot. Well, I'm going to tell you, I mean, Gliss employs 700 employees. The health center employs like four or 500. Mm -hmm. And uh, Element Care employs three or 400. Yeah. So between those three agencies alone, there's, you know, over 1,000 employees. So, uh, all Care um, VNA? Yep. No, and all care, yeah. so, so there's a lot of action going what, on. What now. is the name of that place you took me to? On? April's. No. Not April's. You took me to a Vietnamese restaurant that was oh, awfully oh, good. Oh, yeah. Key? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Not bad, huh? It's good. Yeah, I love and we place. have new coffee shops. We have the white, Popping up all over the white place. Rose, the, the land of a thousand hills. What about all of these niche breweries that I see now? I mean, I, I go to Salem. My son asked for a beer made in Lynn. Bent, Bentwater. Bentwater. Is yes. that right? They're on the Linway. That's on the Linway. But I met with the new owners of the item building the other day, and one of their conceptual plans is to have a microbrewery 
and uh, a small bar area in the item building oh, where where the existing printing press is. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a massive, massive piece of machinery. It goes two floors up in the item building, and it really can't be removed. It, the estimate was a million dollars to disassemble and remove it. So the new owners are thinking of enclosing it in, ga in glass and using it as a backdrop for no, know, right? a room yeah. with the microbrewery. Great idea. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, so, and they're doing the, the, the old security trust bank, is fully renovating that, and the first floor is going to be restaurants, 105, right? 155-seat restaurant, um, a pub-style restaurant called Ooh. Pie and Pint. You heard it first here, folks. Pizza pie and pizza. Uh, pints of beer, and, then, and they just applied for their liquor license, if I'm not well, mistaken. Gonna, yeah, so wonderful. that's on the verge of happening very I need, soon. I need to get all this stuff out, man, okay. so these people know exactly what was, all wasn't, right. and right. now it. I can to my heart. if you want. <laughs> because my, I have Luigi, and I have Lucia, yes. and you have a little black one. Mm -hmm. What's Fair. his name? Her Fair. name? Yeah, it's and we now have Bachland mm -hmm. that did not exist, where you can take your dogs and they can exercise and fool around, which is cute, as opposed to, and the people up there love it, you know, they're not going to... We're not going to have Mr. Castle go up there and complain about Bachland, you know, as violating the there sacred... Were, there was initial protest about it, fearing that there would be just uh, messes up there and noise issues, and but none of Did that happen? came to of fruition. Course. We don't hear anything so is there about anything, it now. Was there anything ever better than the plastic bag for cleaning up poop? <laughs> you know what I mean? The only good thing is, yeah, I don't like plastic bags. I mean, it's perfect. It was like it was made for that. Anyway. The, well, the, I, the I, item I, enclosure. We're going to do your favorite, Paul. The last thing that wasn't, that now is, and quickly, is the wind turbine, right? Yes. On, and that's it, uh, saving a bunch of money, I guess. Do you know who the mother of the wind turbine is? Is Loretta, Loretta Cuff O'Donnell. O'Donnell. Right. Back when she was on the city council, Loretta? I think it started around 2003. She actually bought she bought an advertisement that was, remember it was in Wyoming yes. Square, and it was a picture of her with a windmill behind her? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> I thought she was Rasmussen. But oh, I love her. She, she mark it down, folks. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're here to mark it down. Put this up. Mark it down. The first woman mayor recorded is believed to be Susanna Madura Salta, who served as mayor of Agonia, Kansas, back in 1887, Paul. You did this last week. Yeah. Similarly, Judith Kennedy was the first woman to be elected mayor of the city of Lynn. Did you know that? First one, number 56. Are you familiar with Fiorello <laughs> LaGuardia? The Little Flower. The Little Flower. They named an airport after And he's mm -hmm. considered to have been the greatest big city mayor of all time. And like Mayor Judith Kennedy, he's half Italian and a Republican. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the three contemporary mayors, Paul, this is your line. Mayor de Blasio, Mayor Betsy Hodges, she's crazy, that one from Minneapolis, and Rahm Emanuel, who is certifiable. Interesting, unlike Mayor Kennedy, all our Democrats. Makes, Makes me you wonder. wonder. <laughs> <laughs> In recent years, Paul? Two major U.S. cities filed for bankruptcy, Detroit, Michigan, and Stockton, California. Both cities were run by Democratic mayors. And again, if I could just add to that, we had all that trouble with the, with, uh, in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in St. Louis, all democratically controlled. You forgot Los Angeles and Houston. Yep. Want to go further and further? Yep. Politics, witty. Let's get witty. Politics. Politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it, misdiagnosing it, <laughs> then misapplying the wrong remedies. Groucho, Groucho Marx. Marx. I spelt his name wrong. You like Oscar Wilde, Paul? Yeah. Oscar Wilde said, America is the only country that went from barbarism to decadence without civilization in between. Excellent. <laughs> Madam Mayor, would you mind completing our little wit witticisms here? Sure. What did Mark Twain say? Mark Twain said, when in doubt, tell the truth. That's a good idea, isn't it? Words to <laughs> it's kind of novel. <laughs> I, I like this one. Who's Aber? He's a Did, he's a Lynn legend. A Lynn legend. You like that, huh? Is he related to Abba? Abba, James Abba? Abernathy from okay. the fire department. Okay. Yeah. And I love this. The good thing about old age is it doesn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite comedian of all time is George Collin, and he said the reason I talk to myself is because I'm the only one who answers. I accept. <laughs> How about things to think about, Paul? This is a, this is a, this is a classic too. The very first one. 
Have you ever noticed that a slight tax increase costs you $200 and a substantial cut saves you 30 cents? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor? You will never hear about the truly perfect crime. Paul? The average woman uses her height in lipstick every five years. Is that true? Not for me. I think I have the <laughs> she same too, but I, I, I mean, <laughs> although if you're talking height, I'm much shorter than the average woman, so maybe I have used my height in lipstick, but I don't know. You're next. You're falling down in your job. There's, you know, you, Heart man. attacks are more likely to happen on a Monday, and I'm glad today is Wednesday. Exactly. <laughs> Maya? A lion's roar can be heard from five miles away. But not by me. No. <laughs> no. no. You can't snore and dream at the same time. How's I never that? knew that. Yeah, knew That's before. fascinating. It is. Hmm. Your turn. Facebook, Skype, and Twitter are all banned in China. And while I would say that that's a, <laughs> can't do that around here because it would be a violation, violation of our First Amendment rights, Sometimes I this, can appreciate the fact that it's There not. is something to be said for not participating in Facebook. I right. have my official pages, but I do not have a personal Facebook page. You know, uh, when, when Gliss first got the, you know, the Twitter capacity, and this is you know, five, six, seven years ago, um, set up a Twitter account for me, and I was like, like mm. this, started thinking about it, and then my senior management team sat me down and said um, that they basically banned me from actually, ever actually we're going commenting to, on Twitter. There are some people that would like to do that with our president. Yes. We got a comment, a number of comments. So hopefully we have time to go over them. Uh, the first one is uh, Billy, Billy Trahan is retiring. Yes. Uh, and so is Patty Capano. And, Maria, and Patty Capano and was from Maria, Maria Carrasco. Carrasco. They're yes. all retiring. Yeah. Yes. So, Big changes. Uh, in, in many, uh, it's going to be a change, change of uh, faces and personalities. Well, this year, huh? I'm hoping not in every office in the city, but certainly on the school committee and at well, the I city council level. Well, I would think that the, the president of the Lynn School Committee uh, ought to uh, perhaps uh, re retain her position. Well, we shall see. We shall. So. But anyways, our best to build, we try, that's just in response to uh, one that we got. I'm, uh, as I am retired and try to stay healthy, I walk through Lynn three miles each day, uh, unless I have another appointment. I see and hear a lot from people, and retired people that do that do hear a lot. I stop for lunch, and after almost every stop at Price Right for one or two things, about 70% of the time I see people who use food stamp. And he goes on to talk about the abuse of EBT cards. Is that still prevalent? Is that well, still a problem? Well, I don't think it's an abuse abuse necessarily, but there certainly has been an increase in the number. Um, as you can recall, I remember during President Obama's administration, they were actually running advertisements on TV that were little skits that kind of showed two older women talking and, and trying to remove the stigma of receiving um, benefits from right. the government. Do you recall that, Paul? Right, and promoting it. They actually were yes. advertising in Mexico, if you can believe it. They were the United States was advertising in Mexico to make sure that everybody out in Mexico knew that if they were in this country, they could get EBT cards. But as a result, the number of people using the EBT cards went up. So I can't say that it's due to right. fraud. I'm right. just saying and, and, yeah, sheer and, numbers, they and, and, increased. And, and by way of comparison, if you just think back to 1979, I was 19 years old. I had been just laid off from my job, and I was you know, unemployed for two or three months, right? During that two or three months, I had to go actually go to the unemployment office every second week, stand in line with about 150 to 200 other people waiting to get my unemployment check. And, and while I was in there, I had to prove that I went on three job interviews at the time. That's how it used to be. And what's wrong with it just being, you know, having a system of, you know, I, I, can, I can do one better than that. When I was maybe six or seven years old, so we're talking the late 1960s, my father <laughs> got laid off. So. That's all right, I'm 54. Um, my father got laid off, and we had to go, I think it was down around the blood building, but I was young, so I don't know exactly. But we had to go into this big food warehouse where you got... Big blocks yeah. of orange cheese, and you got dried beans, Carnation. and, and I remember that. dried out eggs, and yeah, yeah. yeah, and that was what we got for food during the time right. that my father was laid off. We didn't yeah. get to go to a grocery store. Bare minimum, based on out. need. 
that we got canned meats. I remember we hated the beans so much we used to make bean bags out of them and sell them. <laughs> like, that, was, that was our fun project. Well, let me get this bags. straight now. If I'm listening and hearing you properly and my ears don't work all that well, so you, your family, you've lived the hard times. Absolutely, yes. So consequently, when you're the mayor of a city that has a profile of folks and constituencies that you live that life, that gives you a little more empathy and a little more identification to what your city's all about. I wish for everybody to have as beautiful a life as I have had. And a lot of it is um, encouragement from your parents and a little bit of self-determination and, and I think kind of a lot of stubbornness as well. But, you know, but there's ways to do that, and we did. I can't think of a better way to wrap the show up because it's at that time, it's gone quickly. I hope that you will bless us with your presence again. I'd be happy to. You know, and it was a pleasure having you here. For all of us here at uh, Lynn TV, have a great week. <laughs>